sure of the people can join later. So thank you very much, Bernardo, for agreeing to join our seminar at, um, of our blockchain study group. And let me introduce you to all our participants. Uh, Bernardo is an uh, associate professor at the IT University of Copenhagen. He was also an assistant professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology from 2017 to 2018. And he received his PhD uh, from the Danish uh, University, uh, Aarhus, Aarhus University, under the supervision of uh, Ivan Damgard and uh, Jesper Nielsen. Uh, he has also been a long term visitor at the Bar Ilhan University in Israel. And um, his research activities uh, include many different topics and um, mainly protocols for secure multi-party computations, where you are co-author with our uh, new colleague, Rafael Gosley. Then also uh, blockchain uh, applications, uh, new technologies for, for cryptocurrencies and smart con contracts. And uh, he was also a co-developer of the first um, uh, POS-based blockchain protocol. Um, most of you probably are familiar with this protocol. It's called Auroboros. And uh, he also developed a protocol uh, called Scrape, Albatross. We'll hear more about it today. And yeah, that's all from my side. Now the screen is yours. Thanks for the invitation. So today I'll give you an overview of recent works in the field of randomness beacons, focusing on Albatross, which is a joint paper with Ignacio Cascudo from the Intea Software Institute. And uh, as you can see, we have some nice logo designed by Nacho <laughs> that I have appropriated in the slides, but uh, let's start with uh, the agenda for today. First, I'll give you a basic introduction to a number of approaches to constructing randomness beacons, and I'll explain the advantages and the disadvantages of each of them. Mostly, I'm going to focus on approaches that allow us to obtain perfect uniform randomness, even though there are many other approaches that allow us to obtain um, biased yeah. randomness or uh, to obtain random values in such a way that less than a third corrupt majority can make the protocol fail. So here I'm gonna be interested in protocols where we are 100% sure that we're gonna obtain perfect uniform randomness as long as a majority of our um, participants are honest. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about our contributions in the Albatross paper and uh, introduce our main technique, which is a new packed publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme and present the basic Albatross beacon and then present the two universally composable versions we have of this protocol. Finally, give you some glimpse on uh, future work uh, that we are working on. Uh, so let's start with a brief introduction to, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did someone ask something? I think someone did mute uh, the microphone. Okay, so let's start with a brief introduction to what a public randomness beacon is. Basically this construction is a central authority you could think of that gives you a bunch of randomness periodically in such a way that all the participants know that these random values are the same that all of the other participants are obtaining and that they are uniformly random. However, you usually don't want to trust this central authority when you have applications such as online lotteries and gambling, uh, smart contract systems, and proof-of-stake blockchains, for example. In those cases, you actually want the parties who are running this higher level protocols to execute a randomness beacon protocol themselves so that they don't have to trust any third party to provide proper randomness and to even act honestly. One of the main ideas that comes to mind when you think of generating randomness using cryptography is uh, employing a coin tossing protocol. That's a pretty old idea from uh, the 80s where you use commitment schemes in order to generate a random value 
among a number of parties. So let's imagine we have these three parties and just for the sake of the of consistency in our discussion, let's assume that they have a public bulletin board that they use to communicate instead of talking directly to each other. They will start this protocol by randomly sampling some binary string locally, and then they will compute commitments to these binary strings. These commitments are basically lock boxes that contain these random values in such a way that no other party knows what is contained inside the lockbox. So we can easily post these lockboxes on our public bulletin board. So we have this commitment to our local randomness on the public bulletin board. And later on, we can open these commitments in order to obtain all of the other values. The guarantee we get here is that once a party opens its commitment, we know that the value that is obtained is exactly the same that was there in the beginning. So this prevents an adversary here from seeing what the values of the other party's uh, commitments are. Let's say we, we get Joe Mojisan, the old baker guy here, to wait for R1 and R2 to be open. And then if he was adversarial, he could actually choose a, an arbitrary value in order to obtain an arbitrary output. However, because of the, the commitment binding property, he cannot do that. The only thing he can do is open his commitment to, a, to the same value that was there in the beginning. So we can simply compute the final random value by XORing all of the individual local random values. And we have a guarantee that if at least one party is honest, we're going to obtain uniform randomness. However, this still has a really big problem for applications where we must be certain that we will obtain a random value. Because if we have an adversary corrupting one of the parties, this adversary can simply refuse to open its commitment. And when it refuses to open its commitment, the other parties do not learn its random value, its random input in order to compute the final randomness. Now you might think, why don't we just ignore this unopened value and add the existing values. This is not possible if we want to obtain uniform randomness because the adversary can bias our output by deciding to open or to not open its own commitment. This adversary, knowing uh, the values of R1 and R3 here, it might, for example, know that the last bit of the final random value will be equal to one if he doesn't open or equal to zero if he opens his, his commitment. So he can choose at least one bit of our final random value by deciding whether to open the, its own commitment or not. So this is clearly bad. And uh, if we want perfect uniform randomness, which we need for a number of applications, we cannot deal with this attack unless we abort the protocol. But then we also don't obtain randomness and if we're running, for example, leader election in a POS protocol, we run into trouble because we, our higher level protocol will have to stop for the lack of randomness. An idea to solve this is trying to construct publicly verifiable GOD coin tossing, which is what we do in the Eurovotos paper. GOD here stands for guaranteed output delivery, which means that no matter what, our protocol will always terminate. It will always give us a random value as long as a majority of the parties are honest. So we consider that the adversary corrupts less than half of all the parties. And we try to use this fact in order to construct a protocol where we are sure we will always obtain a uniformly random value as output. The idea to do this dates back to Rabin and Benoit in 85 in their uh, seminal paper on honest majority MPC, and it basically uses secret sharing to ensure that we can reconstruct the inputs of a cheating party. So the idea here is that apart from committing to your random value, you also secret share this random value in such a way that each other party obtains a share of this value that by itself does not reveal any information about the value, 
but that can be combined with the other honest party shares in order to reconstruct the original input of the commitment. Now, let's say that the adversary does not provide an opening to the commitment. What we would do is publish our shares of the adversary's input, reconstruct the input, and then complete the protocol. However, notice that there are two big issues here. First of all, we need to be able to prove that the random uh, values inside the commitment correspond to the values that are shared on our shares. So I can't simply use a secret sharing scheme by itself to share these random values in the commitments and also commit to those values because as the adversary, I could be committing to a different value than the one I'm sharing. So I can still bias the output by refusing to open my commitment and forcing everyone to reconstruct my shares. So this is one of the problems. You need to prove that the shares correspond to the value in the commitments. And then you have another more worrisome pro problem that will cause you to reach an abort and not obtain a random value, which is that the adversary can share invalid and invalid values and provide invalid shares. So this adversary here would commit to something that it never opens and it would share something in an invalid way such that the reconstruction fails and if this reconstruction fails we cannot complete our protocol so we need a way to both prove that the secret shared values correspond to what we have inside the commitment and to prove that they are valid values that can be reconstructed and this is where publicly verifiable secret sharing comes in. This idea is quite old. It's from uh, 96 by Stadler. And the basic idea of a publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme is that you obtain encrypted versions of the shares in such a way that you can post these encrypted versions to your public bulletin board. And any other party without seeing the actual shares, by only seeing the encrypted versions, they can check that those shares are actually valid and those encrypted shares themselves may serve as a commitment to the actual value that's being shared. So we solve the problem of making sure that the shares are valid and of making sure that your commitments contain the same value that is shared. So basically we would repeat this same protocol here, but those shares that we send to the other parties would be computed with a publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme and they would be posted on the public bulletin board itself so that everyone can, ch can check that the shares are valid before they proceed to the opening and, and reconstruction phases. The problem with using these techniques as they were first uh, described in, uh, as by Stadler is that they were extremely inefficient. Even the previous state of the art by the beginning of the 2000s was still extremely inefficient. It was by uh, Barry Schoenmakers. It improved a lot on Stadler's uh, uh, approach, but it still required each party to perform n cubed operations in order to reconstruct a, an open value, uh, where n is the number of parties. So that's an extremely high um, complexity that would lead to a complexity, a total computational complexity of um, n to the four for running an actual randomness beacon protocol and uh, that would still only yield one random value after all that work. Now, there are alternatives and that's what I'm gonna describe right now, starting by one alternative that you might think you might have heard of in the context of um, proof of stake based blockchain protocols and so on, which is of using verifiable random functions where we try to eliminate the, the need for parties to first commit, then open, possibly reconstruct the value. This idea is to use this verifiable random function primitive where you first generate a key pair, a secret key, public key. You send the public key to a verifier. Then you can take any, lo any local value, locally evaluate this uh, verifiable random function using the local value and your secret key in order to obtain 
an output that looks random. Even if you know the input and the public key, you can only predict what this output is going to be for a certain input if you have the secret key. But most importantly, you can use the, the public key to verify that a certain output was obtained from a certain input given a certain public key. So this verification will tell you yes or no, much like a signature, digital signature verification algorithm. Now, you can use this to construct a randomness beacon. We have a proper proof on how to do this in the Ouroboros Prowess paper, where we propose the first construction of verifiable random function that is both universally composable, meaning that we can actually use it on top of other protocols and in parallel with other protocols without undermining security. And most importantly, we prove that our construction will also yield random values, random outputs, even if an adversary generates a, a key arbitrarily in order to try to input some bias. So our VRF is in a sense unbiasable by an adversary generating uh, an arbitrary public key or public secret key pair, which is not the case of previous approaches. However, as I'm gonna show you, there's still a big problem with this approach. The way that this beacon works is quite simple. We just consider that everyone knows already a previous seed random value, R I minus, I minus one, let's call it if we're in a current epoch I. All parties will evaluate their uh, verifiable random function under their secret key using this previous random value as input. Then after a number of rounds, that they publish this output of the verifiable random function, we consider that enough random values have been uh, posted, enough VRF values have been posted, and then every party checks that every other party has actually computed this uh, random output using the VRF, not just arbitrarily selecting a random output, and we can extract some randomness by hashing using a random oracle the XOR of all of these individual random outputs. We can now just repeat the same protocol using this new value as a seed for the next execution. Actually, we would need to extract a, derive a different value from that, but it's basically the general idea. Then you might think this is much easier than doing the, um, the publicly verifiable GOD coin tossing. However, you have a huge problem in this approach which is the adversary can bias the output by predicting what its random output here is going to be. So the adversary can wait for a bunch of parties to send their own outputs out of their VRS. Then the adversary can compute this, uh, this final output considering whether it's including its own VRF outputs or not. And then it can choose to post its own VRF outputs or not depending on what the, the output is going to be. So the adversary can always bias the output of the random beacon. Now, the reason I'm showing this is to exemplify why we need more complicated techniques to construct proper uh, uniform randomness beacons in cases we need to know we have uniform randomness. There are simpler constructions such as this one based on VRFs there are other proposals just using hash functions even. However, they're always susceptible to adversarial bias. So we can't simply uh, rely on such simple constructions for applications where we actually need perfect randomness. In Uroboros Prowse, we show that this uh, partially biased randomness is actually enough for, ours, uh, for our POS protocol. However, it doesn't mean it's uh, enough for a number of other applications that are relying on perfect randomness. Now, two other approaches that have been proposed recently, they are quite uh, famous, are based on time-based primitives. I'll start by describing the one by ver based on verifiable delay functions by Bonnet, Bono, Bunz, and Fish. It was uh, described in Crypto 18. It, it is uh, relying on this primitive called a verifiable delay function that basically takes an input, and then after a number of time periods, you can specify that it outputs a random output. The whole point of this primitive 
is that before you compute for this amount of time, you do not learn anything about the output. You must compute for this predetermined number of steps in order to obtain your random output. And later on, you can also verify that an input and output pair is valid, meaning that this given output was obtained from this given uh, input. And this verification can be done in constant time. So the verification is extremely efficient, but the computation of the first output is very slow. Now, there's a very simple way to use this to construct a random speaking, right? Instead of committing to a random value, you simply evaluate some value using your, your VDF. Oh, there's a typo here. This should be a VDF. So you evaluate this, out, this input using a VDF. You cannot predict what this input, what the output is going to be before a certain amount of time. So you cannot bias the beacon. However, notice that you must have a very clear proof showing that the communication delay between parties is uh, lower than the delay in the VDF because uh, if I can compute my VDF faster than this communication delay, I can actually learn everybody's uh, input values first, check what the output's going to be, and then choose my inputs uh, and outputs in order to bias the, the output. So I have to have this very subtle guarantee that all of these inputs are fixed before I start evaluating and, and that, I lear that everyone learns each other's inputs before someone else could have evaluated the VDF. Now, this is one of the issues. Uh, so up to now, there was no proper model to understand VDF security under composition, meaning that you couldn't just build the beacon like this because you don't know what happens when multiple VDFs are executed in parallel. This can now be solved using a model that we introduced uh, in this paper called TARDIS together with um, Carsten Baum, Raphael Dosley, Jesper uh, Buznis, and, and uh, Sabine Exner. And uh, this is a model we can now use to formalize this. We're actually working on putting out a, a proper model of VDFs under composition so we can prove that such constructions actually work and understand exactly how would they work. But still, we are left with a huge problem, which is that the practical parameters are not known. Uh, I'm telling you that you need to wait for a certain amount of time to compute this function. This amount of time corresponds to the time it takes your computer to compute a certain squaring over a certain kind of group. However, nobody knows exactly how long this takes and uh, how, how, long, how long this will take to compute this function in physical time. That is not known. So you end up with a class of protocols that even if you can prove them secure theoretically, you still have this very delicate relation between the delay of the VDF and the delay of the network and um, how this is uh, ensured by concrete parameters. So this could be a very nice solution where you just post these uh, values and then you compute the VDFs, but you need to understand the security properly. It still hasn't been done and you need practical parameters to execute this. Now, there's another related uh, approach based on time lock puzzles, which are also, as the name says, timed primitives that allow you to basically encrypt the message to the future. Differently from a VDF, you generate such a time lock puzzle from an input. You know the input and you know some secret parameters. And now you generate this time lock puzzle and you give it to people. It's going to look like a commitment of sorts. So it is this black box that contains this input, but no one knows what is inside this input until they spend enough time computing on this black box, on this puzzle. So when they compute on this puzzle, it gets solved. And from the solved puzzle, you can obtain the same input that was there in the beginning. This uh, primitive is also based on having a computational task that cannot be parallelized, that must be executed sequentially, and for which you know that one execution of one step of this task will take at least some amount of time. So you know 
how many steps of, of how many computational steps it will take to solve your time lock puzzle, and you know how much time this this uh, computational steps correspond to. This was first introdu introduced in a paper by Rivas, Shamir, and Wagner in '96, and they based it on this uh, iterated squaring assumption that says that uh, computing several sequential squarings on uh, a group of unknown order cannot be done more efficiently than actually computing all the squarings in, the, in, in an actual sequence. These days we have proofs in the algebraic group model and a generic group model that this actually is equivalent to factoring. So it seems that this assumption is not um, unreasonable. However, we still don't know proper concrete parameters that will tell us how much physical time doing one of these squaring states. So we introduced in uh, another paper called uh, Kraft, together also with uh, Carsten Baum and Rafael Dowsley and uh, Raf and uh, Jesper Nielsen and uh, Sabine Exner, a randomness beacon based on publicly verifiable time lock puzzles. So in this paper, we construct this uh, uni uh, universally composable and publicly verifiable time lock puzzles where we know that they remain secure when used in, in, a, in a composition scenario. And we have this nice property that you don't have to, similarly to a VDF, you don't have to solve the whole time lock puzzle to verify that a given solution is correct. You can actually verify the solution very fast if you're given this, uh, this proof of a correct solution. And then we build a beacon that follows the style of this uh, Rundau uh, beacon proposed by the Ethereum project. Uh, the, this original Randall beacon has a huge issue that it is very easy to bias. You pay a certain amount of money if you bias, but you still get the bias. So what we're going to try to build here is a, a beacon that is unbiasable and where the optimistic execution, where everyone is honest, will go extremely fast. However, if you need to take a little bit more time to recover from some adversarial attack, the adversary actually pays for that recovery. So the adversary does not get to bias your beacon. It just gets to make it run a little bit slower and it has to pay for that attack. So it's, a, it's an attack where uh, it's actually profitable for the honest people to be participating in, in the protocol because they'll get paid to finish this protocol if the adversary tries an attack. So the idea here is that you broadcast this time of puzzle containing a random value. Remember, it looks just like a commitment. So nobody knows what's inside the time of puzzle. You broadcast this or you put this on a public bulletin board on a blockchain and uh, you set some delay. You say it's going to be solved in T clock ticks. And you set this delay in such a way that it's larger than the broadcast delay or the delay for posting something on the, on the blockchain. And you know that all of the time lock puzzles that are posted before this time t cannot have possibly been generated after seeing your random input because your random input can only be obtained after t ticks. Now, after you wait for this uh, for this broadcast delay where all these uh, time lock puzzles are obtained and where you know that they were not conditioned on your own uh, input, then you wait for parties to reveal their inputs along with a proof that the input is what was contained in the previous time lock puzzle. So this is just like opening a commitment. So in this step, all honest parties who posted their time lock puzzles will be opening their commitments as in the basic coin tossing protocol I showed you in the beginning of the presentation. If some of these parties refuse to open their commitments, like I discussed in the beginning, the good thing now is that the other parties can actually solve this time lock puzzle by computing for t ticks and obtain the input. So an adversary who sends the first message cannot influence the protocol at all. Once the first message is sent, there's no bias that this adversary can put on this protocol. And if this adversary doesn't even send the first message, as I put here in the second uh, step, we simply ignore whatever should have come from this uh, party because it will not introduce any bias. 
Now, finally, you simply XOR all these random values from the valid time lock puzzles. You also discard invalid ones so that you don't get a bias and uh, you get some randomness. And this protocol can go extremely fast uh, as long as the parties review their, their time lock puzzles. I mean, you have to wait for this broadcast delay, obviously, so that you know that uh, enough honest parties have been able to post their time lock puzzles. But after that, after you have set this uh, initial set of uh, time lock puzzles, you simply need to wait for the honest parties to open them. And then you obtain these uh, random values and you obtain uh, by XORing them an unbiased output because we can always recover whatever the adversary have uh, set there. Now, another idea that follows from this uh, rundown style is that uh, you can make the parties deposit some money before they run the protocol and you can take this money away from them if they fail in step two. So if they don't open their time lock puzzles uh, voluntarily, you make them pay for that and you can distribute this money to the other parties who are actually going to solve the time lock puzzle and reveal the value to everyone else. So essentially the adversary cannot uh, bias the output. It can make our very efficient execution take longer, take t clock takes longer, but it's going to pay for this cost. However, once again, we need to know this exact communication delay versus time lock puzzle delay in order to prove this secure properly and to execute this in a secure way. And nobody understands the practical parameters of how long solving these uh, TLPs or VDS is going to take. So this is why we want to focus on uh, publicly verifiable guaranteed output delivery based coin tossing. Because there we understand the parameters extremely well. We don't need any timing. We simply need to post our commitments. Once we see that they are posted, we open them. That's it. And if we don't open them, we can reconstruct them from the publicly verifiable shares that are already posted. So there's no timing there. There's no complicated assumption. It's simply running a protocol by observing what is posted on a broadcast channel or a, a blockchain ledger. So a summary of all um, of this related Bernardo, words. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so in this previous protocol, just uh, one slide back, uh, are we still yeah. assuming honest majority? Uh, depends. Uh, there's, that's a good question. If you want to run this in the semi, uh, in the semi synchronous uh, communication model, where mm -hmm. you don't know what the network delay is, you need to consider an honest majority. Uh, but if you if you assume you have a synchronous network where you know when a timeout happens, or when you know uh, that uh, a round of communication is done, then you can actually run this with a dishonest majority. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. The same goes for the VDF based protocol. So in that protocol, you would have to post these uh, values and then compute the VDFs. Um, you, if, you, if you assume that you know when a round is over, you know that all honest parties will have posted their uh, messages during that round and that's over and that's good. And you know there's at least one honest uh, input here. Same goes for the time lock puzzle based uh, protocol. If you know what this delay is for everyone to broadcast their inputs, then you know that after that delay is done, you have at least one honest party that inputs something and then you're very happy you can, you can, um, you can proceed. However, in the semi-synchronous model, the adversary is the one controlling this delay. And uh, you don't know when you have received a honest time lock puzzle or an honest input, unless you know that a majority of parties has acted and that that means that at least one honest party has acted. In order to know that, you must uh, assume an honest majority. So the, the difference here will really rely on your synchronicity assumption for your uh, communication channel. You could even run this on an asynchronous channel without any termination guarantee, because in the asynchronous channel, the adversary could simply drop all of the messages from the honest parties, and you would never see enough messages to proceed, and you would never be able to finish this protocol. Uh, with the semi-synchronous model, you can prove that eventually you will uh, receive enough messages such that you know at least one honest party has acted and 
that you can finish the protocol. So that, that is the big difference here, uh, whether you work on dishonest or honest majority. It will really depend on the guarantees you have for your communication channel or your ledger or anything like that. In most um, realistic scenarios for broadcast protocols and blockchain ledgers, you would actually want a proof in the semi-synchronous model. So in the paper, we actually argue security only in the semi-synchronous model with honest majority. But if you're happy to, to do synchronous, then you can get uh, this honest majority. So let's Thank summarize you. this uh, related works. Currently, from the PVSS branch of um, randomness beacons, the state of the art is the scrape beacon by uh, myself and uh, Ignacio Cascudo as well, where we need uh, all of n squared exponentiations per random output, where n is the number of uh, parties. And then on the VRF based beacons, the state of the art is the Uroboros Prowse beacon that is very efficient. The, the, the computational complexity is in the order of uh, n exponentiations but, and it requires very low communication as well, but it's biased. As I've shown you, you can always introduce bias on this beacon. Then you have time lock puzzle based beacons, such as the one in our crap paper that we can prove secure, so good on ice, but they rely on these assumptions for which we don't know the parameters. People still have to cryptanalyze the assumptions in order to make sure we know the proper parameters. And then you have the VDF based beacons there are basically a folklore result that has been suggested in papers that construct VDFs, but they don't have full proofs. And uh, especially that there's no proof showing that these uh, primitives will work uh, when composed with each other. So we're still in this uh, situation where the best bet for obtaining unbiased random, uh, uniform randomness is using a PVSS beacon with publicly verifiable uh, GOD coin tossing. Now, our main contributions are first a PVSS scheme with the best amortized complexity we could imagine. There's still probably, a, I can't say it's the best because I think that you could still get a, li a little closer to the lower bound, but are extremely close by a factor of log n. Um, what we do here is first to, instead of sharing single elements in a vector of shares, we are sharing a long vector of elements using fact secret sharing. On top of that, we are extracting more randomness from all of these vectors instead of simply adding them together, we used more clever randomness extraction techniques. And uh, we use some uh, optimized share validity checks to get very nice amortized complexity for, um, for our uh, the randomness beacon. So the situation we have here is that while Scrape had a amortized complexity of n squared exponentiations per uh, random outputs, we have a worst case amortized complexity of log n and a best case complexity that's uh, constant. Now the 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 point here is that we are not no longer generating only one random value from this execution. We are generating about n squared random values. So even though our total complexity here in the worst case is n squared times log n, when we amortize it over the n squared uh, random values we can generate, we get all of, of log n. And the same goes for the best case where everyone is honest, where everyone opens their commitments and so on, uh, we actually require n squared uh, exponentiations, but we generate n squared values, resulting in an amortized complexity that is constant. We also introduce UC definitions of randomness beacons as publicly verifiable GLD coin tossing, along with two matching constructions based on uh, UC non interactive zero knowledge and on uh, homomorphic commitments. The importance of this is because as I have been telling you, we cannot simply use these beacons or any cryptographic protocol for that matter 
in parallel with other protocols and other primitives if we don't prove that they retain their security under composition. And what is a randomness beacon if not a tool for building other protocols? So it's rather useless to build a randomness beacon that doesn't have any composability guarantees. In previous results, uh, these unbiasable beacons that output uniform randomness, they were only proven to be sequentially composable so that it could run one execution of these protocols and then run other protocols after that using the random value, but not do everything in parallel as we would like. And we fixed this problem in this paper by introducing this uh, UC definitions and constructions of this primitive. For the biasable beacons based on BRFs, we've, we've known a uh, UC construction for a while now, um, but as, uh, it has the problem that it is inherently biasable, so it's not good for applications where we need proper randomness. So let's look into these uh, techniques that we introduced. First of all, we have the albatross pact verifiable secret sharing, that, uh, the publicly verifiable secret sharing, meaning that we can share a vector of values within a vector of shares, not only one single uh, value. We start by doing a packed sh Shamir sharing, not just a uh, simple uh, Shamir linear secret sharing, but a, the packed version, where we can share a vector of, of values into a vector of shares. And then we will encrypt the shares using this uh, encryption scheme where we raise these public keys that are known, that we assume to be known, they're posted in a ledger somehow, uh, to the share. So what this encryption scheme is going to allow us to obtain is not a decryption of the share itself, but G to the share. However, because we're simply interested in obtaining random values, this is good enough for us. We don't need to obtain the share again. We just need to obtain this G to the share, which is enough for us to do homomorphic operations on the exponent of G. Uh, if we want to use this scheme to share um, actual arbitrary values, we can still do that. We just use the outputs as one-time pads and then we one-time pad our, um, our arbitrary values. But this is not interesting for our uh, randomness beacon, really. Now, it's important to note the parameters that we can obtain here. Basically, L is, uh, is the length of our, share, of our shared vector here, of our shared values. And L is going to be equal to N, the number of parties, minus 2T, where T is the corruption threshold, and in our case, the reconstruction, the privacy threshold. So we want that even if T shares are known, no information can be obtained about the shared secrets. And we want T then to be the maximum amount of parties that can be corrupted. And our total number of uh, shared values is equal to n minus 2t. Well, this shows us the following. This scheme will degrade to the same efficiency as the scrape scheme if when we approach honest majority where less than half of the parties are corrupted, but where you can have as many parties close to the half as you want being corrupted. This will degrade to the point where you can only share one value. And, uh, and then you're going to support, you're going to be able to withstand uh, all those majorities there, a corruption of up to less than half of the parties. However, if we have a threshold of one third of corrupted parties, as is the case in many broadcast and consensus protocols, we actually get this very nice complexity where we can still reconstruct one third of n values and um, from them extract something that's close to n squared times uh, one ninth. So we can still get n squared, something in the order of n squared values using only um, n squared exponentiations. Now, an important part here is that you have to publish a non-interactive zero knowledge proof showing that these shares that you have encrypted that are inside your ciphertexts are actually valid shares of a certain value. This means proving that these shares are points of a polynomial P of X that has degree at most 
t plus l minus one. And we also show some uh, nice, neat uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proof for this statement that is more efficient than trying to use some generic zero-knowledge proof system so that we can prove this efficiently. Now, this, this was a sharing phase, right? When you want to, after that, you want to verify. Verifying is very easy. You simply verify this NISIX. You have the, the public keys posted somewhere. You have the shares posted somewhere, the encrypted shares. I mean, you simply verify these NISICs and you know they contain valid shares. For the reconstruction, then each party has to decrypt their, their uh, shares. You need only N minus T parties to do it, but then they decrypt the shares and they post another NISIC showing that the decrypted shares they are posting were inside the ciphertexts conditioned on their secret keys. Then everyone verifies that these decrypted shares are correct and they can reconstruct these uh, random values from this vector of random values from the shares by following the peck chamir reconstruction algorithm. Uh, if you think of it, we do it not directly on the shares, but on the exponents of G, which is perfectly possible because we only need to compute linear functions on these shares in order to reconstruct the, the vector of random values. And we can always do this, uh, evaluate these linear functions on the exponent of G. So that's what we're doing throughout the protocol. And why we do it on G? Because it allows us to use this very simple encryption scheme and this very simple NISIX that gives us the, the, the efficiency that we need. Now, the Albatross beacon basically uses our PVSS scheme in almost a, a black box way. We share, we, each party shares a vector of random values and publishes the encrypted shares to the public bulletin board using our PVSS scheme. Then you verify all shares and you discard the parties who sent invalid shares. You don't care about them, they're invalid. They wouldn't give you any, any value anyway if they were to be opened later. And then the honest parties reconstruct the vectors that remain. Actually, we can do this more efficiently, more efficiently than reconstructing. We can simply review the randomness we used in constructing the shares and then everyone can check that what we're revealing is what, what is inside this uh, uh, encrypted shares, more or less like the commitments. And uh, then after reconstructing these vectors, either waiting for honest parties to actually reveal them or reconstructing them from our shares, we can extract L squared uniformly random outputs from these uh, reconstructed uh, vectors. We use for that a technique that dates back to the early 90s, late 80s by it's a paper by Johan Hostel and Russell um, Pagliazzo and some other people where they, they, they propose this idea of perfect T resilient functions that it can use to extract um, randomness from certain inputs. In our case, we do this by using a Vandermond matrix and multiplying it by the matrix composed by these uh, random vectors. And the output is a, is a matrix that is, um, that, that is guaranteed to be random, uniformly random and uncorrelated. So basically you, with this vendor mode matrix, you have the guarantee that the matrix has a certain rank and that there are no uh, correlations between the rows and so on. So you can, uh, and some matrices in there, so you can use it to extract this randomness. If you're familiar with this kind of technique, this is a similar, to the hyperinvertible matrices uh, technique by uh, Martin Hitt and Ulima and, and company, where you also use a, uh, you use a stronger construction where your T resilient function away here is actually this hyperinvertible matrix where every sub matrix is invertible. So you show that when you multiply something by this matrix, the output is going to be uncorrelated. You lose all the correlations there and you can extract randomness. Uh, the, the whole point here is that by carefully choosing our T resilient function as a Vandermont matrix, we get all the nice complexity that we get without uh, going through complicated analysis or techniques. Now, there are some asymptotic optimizations we can do here. 
I told you one before, which is instead of reconstructing, we could just um, open the values that were inside the, the, the shares. Now, for the unopened secrets that we actually have to reconstruct, we can do it better than having everyone reconstruct locally. We can divide the parties into a number of committees with log n parties, and each of these committees will recover one of the secrets from the uh, one of the un uh, unopened secrets. They will internally reconstruct the secrets and share the reconstructed secrets with each other. Then they will verify the, the secrets that are reconstructed by other committees so that they catch if we have a committee with too many adversarial parties and they give us badly reconstructed secrets, we can still verify this, uh, this very efficiently and catch them. And then if some of these reconstructions are bad, we reconstruct only those locally. The verification is very cheap using a trick that we show in the scrape paper where we use some dual code words uh, of the code induced by our Chemiosecure chairing to do the verification. And if all of the committees reconstruct, we, we, we actually get, this is a typo here, we actually get log n. Um, not, not constant, but we get log n uh, exponentiations. Now, some concrete beacon optimizations that we, we, if we're running that on a ledger, we can actually do it mostly off ledger by posting commitments to the shares, but uh, only opening the commitments and posting the actual shares and so on to the ledger if we have some trouble that some parties don't reconstruct their uh, randomness. And we can also do this other trick where we only reconstruct linear combinations of the unopened secrets instead of reconstructing all of them. So essentially, we would be reconstructing only what we need, what we obtain after doing the, the T resilient function computation. It's not yet written on the paper, but we have discussed it, as you can see in this handwritten uh, notes here. Um, so this brings us to the UC versions. In the version based on non-interactive secret sharing, we basically add an equivocal commitment to the shares apart from the, the encryption. And we use UC non-interactive secret sharing to prove that both the ciphertext contain valid shares and that the commitments, equivocal commitments contain the same as the ciphertext. Now, basically what we do is that we use this trick where we can extract shares from these uh, ciphertexts and we can do equivocation in showing that we have shares that are not the ones we actually had in our simulation by using the equivocal property of the equivocal commitments and the, the NISX zero knowledge property. So this is basically what we do here. It's very similar to our previous approach, but we need to work a little more to build a proper UC simulator. The one based on UC commitments is much more interesting because we introduced this new primitive called designated verifier commitments, where basically, let's say we have a bulletin board just to make the discussion easier. It doesn't need it at a bulletin board. It can be done with the uh, point-to-point point channels. But just let's say we have a bulletin board to discuss this. And we say we have a sender that posts a commitment to the bulletin board. And then we have a designated verifier who receives the key, the opening information from this, uh, from this commitment directly from the sender. Okay, now this designated verifier can open the commitment and be convinced that it contains a certain message. And without any sender interaction, that's a very important part here. Now this designated verifier, without ever talking to the sender again, can post the same open information to the bulletin board while convincing a number of verifiers that this open information was the one sent by the sender and that it and that it uh, makes this commitment open to a certain message. So basically here, you are delegating the opening of your commitment to a third party, and this third party can perform this opening on your behalf without any of the verifiers having to ever talk to you. So this allows the sender to send a commitment, then send an opening to only one party, and then disappear. And even if the sender disappears, this designated verifier will still be able to convince other verifiers that this uh, commitment is, uh, this opening is valid. Now you might think of uh, random oracle based commitments that would allow you to do something like that. Well, they're too weak for our case because we need additive homomorphism. They are hopelessly non-homomorphic. 
Then you might think of something like um, peers and commitments or other standalone commitments that, are, that might allow you to do that. It's still hopeless because they're not composable and we need these commitments to be composable because we're going to be running a lot of them in parallel and executing additively homomorphic operations on their inputs. So we need to build this primitive from scratch, which we actually build using techniques uh, from um, a paper from, from last year by uh, myself, uh, Nacho Cascudo, Rafael Dowsley, Nico Dudling, um, yes, no, 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 yes, but uh, Ivan Dango and uh, Irene Giacomelli, and tools from a paper on public verifiability by myself, Carsten Baum, and um, Rafael Dowsley. So we combine these uh, tools to obtain such uh, designated verifier commitment scheme. And our, our beacon construction is actually quite simple after we have this primitive here. We compute our Shamir or packed Shamir shares. We commit to them using our UC additively homomorphic commitments. They allow us to do additive uh, operations between commitments, between the values and the commitments without seeing them. We can make it non-interactive by using the future mirror uh, heuristic as pointed out in our paper from last year. Then we use the scape, the scrape trick to check if the shares inside the commitments are valid. Again, we use the future mirror to generate this random dual code words we need. And notice that this, tr this trick only requires linear computations, uh, computations of linear functions. So we can do that on top of our additively homomorphic commitments. Then we, publish designated openings to the shares, to each share towards each, um, towards each party. Now, each party gets to open the commitment to its own share. And it can check if it's opening if it's correct or not, if the share, I mean, it knows the shares are okay because you did this, this great trick. And then um, they can check whether uh, they have uh, received a, a, a proper opening or not. If they have, they can open it later. If they, if they haven't, they can complain and say, hey, this guy sent me an invalid uh, commitment to this share, even though the share is valid. So we kick him out of the computation. Now he cannot bias the computation anymore. So we get a, a proper beacon. Then in the end, uh, after all, all parties are convinced they have proper commitments to the shares and that the shares are valid, they can simply open their, designatedly open their commitments and verify and everyone verifies this, this, uh, these uh, commitments are open correctly and they can reconstruct the values in the clear. So this gives us, uh, interestingly, the first uh, randomness beacon that, that can be based on the CDH assumption. All the previous constructions were based on DDH and other, and other assumptions. And uh, one of the first is that can be proved you see and uh, using a characteristic of our commitment schemes, we can actually batch a lot of executions of this uh, beacon together without increasing the computational complexity and uh, getting much more randomness in the end. So this is, uh, I like the, this, uh, this aspect that we get better batching and a construction under weaker assumptions. So for future works, uh, of course, gradual release of randomness values. We have some ideas on that. We write in at some point how to, instead of re releasing all the, the full matrix of values, we want to release one element at a time. Then we can also, we think we can make our scheme proactive uh, and publicly verifiable so that we can reshare values without opening them, without reconstructing, but reshare them towards different parties. And um, also applications of this to secret single leader election. If we have this, uh, we, we can use the fact that this values remain secret for a while to do this. And then optimizing the UC constructions, of course, it would be a nice goal. And looking for other applications of this uh, designated verifier commitments. So uh, that was it. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Bernardo. It was very interesting and very informative. I think we have a couple of questions. Uh, may I ask a question, Professor? Yeah, Rancho, go ahead. Uh, so, so the Albert Ross is kind of like a one-shot distributed randomness generation protocol, which means that it only generates a single or a batch of 
randomness, random strings. And uh, for the randomness beacon, it's basically something that it generates the random strings continuously. So I'm not sure how can, how to make the error but error but rows to continuously generate randomness. Mm. It's uh, actually quite simple. You execute it again. Actually, all of the randomness uh, beacon constructions, they're based on one protocol that outputs one or a set of values of random values. And then you execute it once and again and again and again and again for every for every new random output you would like to obtain from your beacon that's how all the other protocols work as well uh okay but uh so in this case there should be something like a leader or a sun or a word clock that keeps the pace of the execution of uh, this protocol so that the randomly speaking generates the randomness regularly rather than just stop working, right? You don't really need a clock. You can simply start executing it again after you obtain an output. Mm. Then how can nodes know which round they are in? Or maybe, for example, some nodes think they are in the round N and some nodes think they are in the round N plus one. Or this might happen, but I'm not sure how to well, this, this doesn't happen because the parties start the execution uh, together. So if, if uh, uh, you have a committee of parties that's executing this, right? And they start executing it, they know when the execution finishes because they get the output so they can restart. They don't simply start in the middle of the protocol. You need to either start in the beginning or after an execution is done. That's how every other randomness beacon works. Okay, I see. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Mohamed? Uh, yeah, I have a question about this uh, proving a share valid. So what do we exactly mean? What do we exactly mean by a share being valid? Well, let me go back there. Uh, this. You need to prove that uh, the shares are points of a polynomial P of X that has degree at most T plus L minus one. But P is secret, right? Yes. You, that's why you prove it in zero knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you prove in zero knowledge that the encrypted shares are ciphertexts of this form PK to the share such that these shares, uh, all of them together, are vectors that are obtained by evaluating this P of X in points I. The points I are, are public. They can be public without revealing anything. Uh, and you, you prove that there are evaluations of this P of X that is secret in this points I, such that P of X has degree at most T plus L minus one. That's the statement you're proving. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. And you prove it in zero knowledge. Then we have, uh, you, of course, you can prove it in zero knowledge because every NP statement is provable in zero knowledge, but we actually construct a nice, uh, simple proof of this uh, statement that we can use in, uh, to prove, like, in, in one goal that both the, the um, you have these shares in the exponent of the public keys and that they are points of this uh, polynomial. Mm -hmm. And because I'm wondering, wouldn't it be hard to prove that the degree is actually this much, like n plus t, sorry, t plus l minus one? Or is this something easier? Uh, it's not very easy. We actually have a nice trick for that. Um, so what we do is derive from what we did in Scrape. Um, you can show, you, you basically look at this as uh, error correcting codes. And you know that if you take a dual, the dual code of zero correcting code, and you take a random uh, code word from that, if you compute the inner product between this vector from obtained from this polynomial and a vector obtained from the, um, the dual code word, you will get something that is equal to zero if you compute this inner product, if it's validly generated. So we do a little bit of a Code interior work there to do this this uh, proof in a more sensible way. 
But okay. well, anyway, even if we didn't do it in this more efficient way, every statement in NP is provable in zero yeah, knowledge. Yeah. So we could still say that. I mean, uh, but we do it in a more efficient way than just throwing some heavy tool on top. We are uh, we, we reduce this to to proving that we get this nice uh, inner product such that uh, such that the 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 result is zero so that we know that the, the polynomial has a maximum degree and then we're all good okay okay thank you um so so these pro all these proofs and verifications they all take um runtime of n squared exponentiations per party is that right or? yes Okay, and the communication. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, please, please, please go ahead. Uh, and the communication is also of n squared per party, or the communication is of uh, n squared in total. Ah, in total. Because uh, you need each party to publish uh, n shares, basically, along with the proofs. So this uh, this turns out to be uh, in the order of n squared because you have n shares published and n parties publishing these n shares plus uh, proofs. The concrete, the concrete uh, constant is actually quite small because the encrypted shares are only one group element long. Then the, um, the proofs are a couple group elements plus one ring element. So yeah, you get you got something like four times a security parameter for the length of this uh, group and ring element representations times n squared, I would say. For the UC constructions, it's a bit higher because you have the overhead of doing this uh, UC primitives, but it's still not too bad. Okay, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> and the Ouroboros Prow uh, communication is or linear in N, right? I'm oh, sorry? Uh, Ouroboros Prowls uh, or Prowl yeah. communication is uh, linear in N. Uh, for the beacon? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's linear in N, but then also biasable. That's the okay. That's the big problem. You could even do an analysis um, if you want to reduce the bias in in, in Ouroboros Prowls. You, you, our analysis shows that you can post more and more and more and more and more of your F outputs. So if you post a huge number of, of, of uh, VRF outputs, you can make your uh, bias basically as low as you want. But then at some point, that number of outputs actually becomes higher than that squared if you, if you want to get to a negligible uh, bias or something like that. So mm -hmm. I, it really seems to me that if you want, um, we haven't proven a, 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 a formal lower bound here, okay? But it seems to me that if you want uh, proper non-biased um, randomness, you will need something that is that that is at least with amortized complexity at least constant. I don't think you can go lower than one. You can you can get a a, a rate that is higher than one or something like that because you're gonna need uh, you're gonna need to send at least as much information such that in the proof you can extract the um, the random values. So that when you're doing the simulation, you can extract this random value. If you want something that's not biased, biasable, right? In uh, in in over, in over those problems, we don't we can get under this requirement because we allow bias. So we don't actually have to extract exactly what comes out in the end. We have to extract only some uh, inputs from uh, the the VRS and so on. So the proof works in a different way, and it also gives you bias. So that's the big difference here. I would say that uh, in the current uh, scenario, like in the with current literature, if you're looking for uh, biased randomness, if biased randomness is enough, you could just use the, the Prowse approach because um, it's extremely efficient. It's all linear in the um, it's linear in the in the number of parties, both in terms of communication and, and computation. Um, but it, it has this bias. So if you need proper randomness, uniform randomness. You need to go for one of these uh, coin tossing based approaches, at least until people know better about the parameters and concrete parameters of these uh, time primitives. 
Mm -hmm. the, the time, the ideas based on time primitives are very nice, but you would really, you, you would need to be extremely certain about this, uh, this, this delay parameters, how long it actually takes to compute this. Because if someone manages to compute, to, to compute this faster than everybody else, then they silently break your protocol because you can't even detect they are biased in your protocol because they can just solve all your time lock puzzles and VDS really fast, then choose their own inputs in order to bias everything arbitrarily and you don't even detect this is happening. So it's, <laughs> it's until you know this parameters very well, it's quite dangerous to use it. So, so for, for this bias, um, you have an upper bound on the bias or? Yeah. For the VRF approach, there we, we have an upper bound on the exact bias that you can uh, introduce. In and the how? Meeting. And how do you? So what's the idea for how you handle this bias in the application? Or I mean, why is it still sufficient to have a bias? Then? So we show that we are the application. What we're using that random beacon for is for electing leaders who will post blocks. So the, the protocol works with, you divide time in several uh, slots and you say that in every slot you must have a block and that one party who, uh, who is elected as, as a leader for one of the slots is the one who gets to post a block. Mm -hmm. So we do some super complicated analysis to show that actually having the adversary bias, the, the randomness used to choose the leader to post the blocks will not impact too much the security of the blockchain protocol. So for that application, we can show that it's no problem. For that protocol, so it's not even a statement in general, it's not a statement that says, I mean, there's a, thousands of protocols that need leader election. We don't prove in general, just prove that for Ouroboros Prowls, if, if you have the, the randomness under a certain bound, uh, the, the randomness bias under a certain bound, the adversarial, the best adversarial strategy will still not give adversary control over the consensus protocol. Yeah. Then uh, using the bound, then we prove that we have this bound on the, on the bias for the randomness beacon. And uh, we just make sure that that bound is achieved. Basically, you limit this bound, the more, um, the more VRF values, VRF outputs you consider in the beacon. And uh, also the more honest parties you have, right? Uh, then, then it just, make a, a very long epoch where you're giving VRF inputs, VRF outputs, I mean, VRF outputs, a lot of them, so that we get reached the, 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 the bounded bias we want, and then you can run the protocol from that. Yeah, I see, okay. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, by the way, this um, paper, DG, DGRR18, what, what is this paper again? Uh, what slide is that? I think it was. I see. I think it was. DGKR? Uh, DGK, yeah, yeah, DGKR, yeah. Uh, that's uh, Uroboros Praus. Ah, oh, right, okay, yeah. All right, thank you. I mean, does the VRF approach has, had also been uh, proposed uh, in, in one of the many Algorand papers and in the Thunderella paper, I think? No, there's no like paper. But the, the thing we do here is that we actually prove that this works when you consider all the VRFs in composition. And we do this uh, malicious key generation resilience that ensures that an adversary cannot introduce bias by generating a key arbitrarily, which is the case of uh, regular VRF constructions. I mean, because the regular VRF uh, definition only talks about the pseudo randomness of outputs under keys generated honestly following the key generation algorithm. It yeah. gives you none of the regular construction gives you any guarantee on the pseudo randomness of the output given arbitrary keys. So we had to work on that because if we want to upper bound the bias of our beacon in, and we have a lot of uh, adversarial corruption there, we, <laughs> if we had even more bias to deal with, the proof wouldn't, wouldn't work. But you have to assume that the input to the VRF is, is random, right? Yeah, so you need to start with a CRS that has some uh, random, some randomness, some initial randomness. 
Yeah. And uh, after that, you use the new randomness that you use that is a little bit biased as a new input. And then you again show that if this, out, this little bit biased output is still okay to be used in that beacon mm -hmm. to generate the next value. So you basically run this protocol again and again and again and again and again yeah. uh, using the previous, uh, previously generated random output. In the first time you run it, you're going to need some uh, CRS that contains some initial random value. Right. So that, that is also a caveat of this uh, approach, right? Because you need this initial CRS with the other uh, approaches here with the coin tossing style or uh, TLP and VDF approaches, you just, you don't need any previous setup in that sense. Well, you're gonna need some random oracles to do them with uh, UC security. I mean, we prove in, in uh, this TARDIS paper that for TOPs and also VDFs, it follows from that proof. If you want to do this with proper composability, you need a random oracle, so you're gonna need a random oracle, but you don't need any CRS, any trusted setup like that. For the coin tossing based on PVSS, we mostly build it uh, using the random oracles in order to achieve efficiency because we want NISIX and if we, we could possibly build it based on CRS is too, if we instantiate the CRS, the, the NISIX based on CRSs, but then um, that's just more, <laughs> that's much, much less efficient. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. One last question. If not, uh, thank you again, Bernardo. Thank you for your talk. That was uh, really great. Thank you had time to give us this talk. And probably next year you can come to Monash. And I would really like to hear the talk about um, what was it? Chemical cryptography. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a rub session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, thanks for uh, listening. Uh, if you guys have any further questions on this, I'm happy to answer by email or anything. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.